Good morning, everyone. I'm Cathy Pittam from RacePoint Group, and uh, welcome to our session on digital channels and social media and the impact it's having on business today. I'd like to welcome our panel. Um, we have uh, on the far, on my far left, your far right, Ian Drew of Arm, uh, probably uh, one of our favourite British tech stocks, the semiconductor IP company that uh, took on Intel in a David and Goliath battle and uh, is now in probably every device that we touch uh, in our everyday lives, but has made its name mostly for uh, mobile uh, devices originally. Um, Ian is EVP of strategy at Arm. Hein Pretorius, sitting next to him, is COO of the MIH group, uh, a large media group, and he is responsible for Eastern Europe, so a lot of very interesting um, aspects um, of social media development in, in that area at the moment. And we have Gert de Sager, I hope I pronounced that correctly, of um, the global um, media and advertising group DDB. So welcome, everyone. I'm going to join you. We wanted to make this as um, valuable for everybody as possible and as interactive rather than talking at you. So we thought one of the uh, best ways to do that will be that after the second question that we ask the panel, uh, we'll actually pause for interaction and any questions that you might have to keep it lively because we're going to be covering um, different aspects of, of social media and, and digital channels. Um, and I think that's probably the, a more enjoyable uh, format for you too. So, the first um, question we have really, I guess um, I'd like to ask the panel certainly, are they feeling Facebook-ish at the moment? With the announcement last week of um, Facebook's pending IPO, uh, uh, valuing the company at something around, um, I think, 75 million, something like that. Yeah, up to 100 million. Um, it's interesting to see how, how the impact of the internet and indeed social media and social networking in, in that respect uh, is having on our, on our industry in particular. And I'd like to get a view from the panel on what they think uh, the most important digital developments in the coming year or so will be for our industry. Ian, would you like to kick oh, us off? Thank you. Um, thanks, Cathy. I'm a little bit scared with all the lawyers in the audience here. <laughs> So I have to say allegedly occasionally. Um, but I actually think the biggest change is going to be all of the enterprise guys in the audience here starting to use the internet on their phones for things other than Facebook. Use of the internet and social media in your daily life, in your enterprises, opening up those contacts, opening up those channels putting away the fax machines will become very important. And we see huge growth in that. And we see huge opportunities around the world. So that's my one. Thanks, Ian. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to refer to my iPad. That's a Because I've got, I, I found a picture. And I don't know who the author is, but um, it looks like it's a little bit of a whiteboard session. <clears throat> and it's social media explained. So I'm just going to read it to you. Twitter is, I'm eating a tag donut. Facebook is I like donuts. Foursquare, this is where I eat donuts. Instagram, here's a vintage photo of my donut. YouTube, here I'm eating donut. Watch me eat my donut. LinkedIn, my skills include eating donuts. <laughs> P interest, here is a donut recipe. Last FM, now I'm listening to donuts. And Google Plus, which I think is a bit of a Sideswipe on Google. I'm a Google employee who eats donuts. <laughs> so, what I get from that is, is human ingenuity is, is unbelievable. We take a simple expression of interest in donuts, slice it up into anything you can find, and then sell it back to the so called smart people at 100 billion valuation. Um, but where social media is going to go, I think it's exactly in that direction. It just continues to to split out into so many different areas. Um, and taking a stupid thing like a donut, which is very stupid, but you have an interest in something. And the way you express that interest can be in so many different ways and engaged in so many different media. Um, that I don't think Facebook is the be all and end all of social media uh, or any of the other players for that matter. And 18 months down the line, we'll probably have another conference and we'll be sitting here talking about 
something else that's come along. So as with every part of the internet, we have an immense amount of what we call verticalization yeah. going on in commerce, um, in every area that you can find. And I think the same is happening to on the social space. So I think we're going to see even more things coming out than what we're already trying to remember that's happened in the last year. And do you think that splintering um, will be around um, specific areas of interest? Well, it's going to be, and we'll get to that later in the session. Uh, you, know, um, you know, people our age in this room, and we're all the wrong age in this room, don't get privacy because some of us who have kids and teens, they just to, to put everything online. Um, whereas when you reach a certain age, you start pulling back on your privacy. And you're gonna see a lot of things that are going around that, scrubbing services, cleaning up your profile because you're going for a job interview, mm. you know, all of those kind of things. And a lot will evolve around that. But I think, um, and again, I'm running ahead in the session, but there's gonna be a lot to do with who you are as a person. If you want to create your other life on the internet in a digital way, there are different faces that you present. You present a different face in the real world where you work to who you are with your family, to who you are with your friends. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how we live. We're all human beings. And the same happens online. And the more that happens online and the more it becomes publicly available, the more you'll either channel it to show the right profile, channel it to engage in the right social media, scrub it, clean it, change it. Um, and there is no one solution that does that all. So you'll see more of the splitting out as we move forward, which will just, for all the lawyers in the room, and I don't know if I should stay, say notwithstanding or without prejudice or allegedly, <laughs> um, it's gonna create a hell of a lot more work in terms of privacy, data protection, mm -hmm. profile protection, um, you know, who you are. Interesting, thank you, thanks very much. Gert, your views on the biggest digital developments this year? Um, well, first of all, I think that for next year's conference or the year after that, I think that we will not talk about the distinction between digital, something different from other ways of doing business. And the same for social, because it is so much part of every day's life for so many people. Uh, whether it's Facebook, 800 million people using it every day, 50% 50, 50 of people on Facebook actually check in every day. Maybe in your group, the activity is even higher. Mm. Um, so it's just part of our e everyday life. Maybe not in this room, because I checked on, on Twitter and I saw that nobody was tweeting about the fact that they are at a conference about tech leaders, which is very strange. Tech leaders not tweeting about what is happening here. Um, but if I look at Near, near future, I, I think of three important things. Well, we talked a lot about cloud computing, but I think the, the big uh, opportunity and issue is going to be big data, and how are we going to treat all that data? It's going to be, I think, a huge opportunity in social commerce, since uh, today, well, you said face bullish uh, evaluation between 50 billion and 75 billion, if you know that 85% of that revenue today comes from advertising, 12% mm. comes from uh, virtual games, that means that there's a, an, an immense potential of um, Facebook taking little cents left and right from the whole open graph that is in every big media player, that is in every big uh, retailer. And the last one is maybe not an opportunity, but I think maybe, and I hope not a threat, and that is connectivity. Everybody wants to be connected every day, everywhere. Um, when I come from the train, I've got crappy 3G, then I have troubles going from Wi-Fi connection to Wi-Fi connection. I read today that there's an article in The Observer here in the UK where they are going to restrict broadband here in London during the Olympic Games yeah. because everybody is going to try to have some kind of connection and it's going to crumble the whole system. Mm. If you think about cloud computing and suddenly you don't have access anymore, then you can't work anymore. Mm. So that is on one hand side, I think, a threat, but also a huge opportunity for people who can, on a technological level, whether it's hardware or software, really do something about that data crunch. Because everybody wants it, because it's so much part of everyday's life. So those are the three main areas where I think there will be um, important developments yeah. in, the, in the near future. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. That's a lot so, of Kathy, can I just ask a question of the audience? Because I'm. Who here? Go can I just have a show of hands? Who here goes online? Put your hands up. Okay, thank you. <laughs> if you ask 20-year-olds the same question, nobody puts their hand up because online to them is a utility. The internet is a utility to the new generation. I grew up having a 65K dial-up modem and going online meant you had to go do something. The word online isn't used in the internet generation now. It's access to the internet and that's it. And when you go to China, when you go to emerging markets, they talk about access to the internet. They never use the word online. So when we all start talking about online and offline, the new world is all about online. There is no going online, it's there. It's a utility and the new generation are using it unlike anything before for social media, for enterprise, and that's where the new business models will come from because it's there. You look at the way you, electricity revolutionized the industrial era. We are gonna have the same thing happen with the internet because it's there and these new entrepreneurs will use that. Good point, thank you Ian. So my second question, and this is um, after this uh, question, we'll actually throw it open to some questions from the floor too, is really looking at um, digitization overall and with um, video and the <coughs> written word and music all progressing fast towards complete digitization and everybody scrambling to understand how to monetize their trends with the potential for whole industries to be disintermediated by this development. Uh, my question really is, how do technology companies um, pick the right channels in this very pluralized world? Hi, any views? I think you know, we, we uh, ascribe to a very simple concept, which is follow your consumer. Have to engage with where the consumer engages. So you've had in, in media itself uh, a lot of examples of absolute and utter failures um, of print trying to go online and, uh, and things like that. And, and it's a simple thing. Um, you're taking something that is engaged offline and assuming that because there is an online version that the same people will go and engage it online. And that necessarily is not true. Mm. So um, even though we have a lot of digitization going on, uh, it, is, it is going to the consumers that, that, that consume and understanding where they consume it. There are so many things that we can do um, from a, so many different kind of angles and, and companies and sometimes it's difficult to understand, do I do a Facebook ad, do I do a Google you know, keyword ad, do I, you know, what do I buy contextually from a search perspective? You know, do I digitize my content, don't I? Mm. Um, in the end, it's where your consumer is. So if, if you have a massive base of consumers that are engaging on Facebook, then naturally that's where you go. Um, and if you're acquiring more through other search engines, that, then naturally you have to go there and you have to balance these things. Uh, I don't think there's a silver bullet for any of this. Um, but if you're trying to, to engage the older generation that's still, as you rightly said, you know, think about going online, uh, your engagement is lower than super users like ourselves or the younger generation that just simply lives there. Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, um, it's something every company has to uh, attack, something every company has to think about. And you're starting to see, quite funny enough, in the, in the job industry world, you're starting to see companies now talking about chief digital officer. Yeah. Used to be down in IT, down in the dumps where we fed people with pizza boxes through the bottom of the door, is now sitting on a board position. Yeah. So that's very, very different. I'm, from my perspective, the one thing that this social media digital world gives you is real-time feedback. Whereas before, you had to wait and ascertain and get market research. What you can do now is real-time feedback on what works and what channels work and what doesn't work. And it brings a real dynamism to the market that you're in. And so you can actually see from a real-time perspective, campaign X works, campaign Y doesn't. And you can see shooting ahead of the curve where things are going. You can see trends moving up and down. 
I think you have to put a lot more thought into what you do and your channels because that becomes important real time. It's no longer a case of every month figuring this out. It's almost done on a daily and hourly basis. And so the speed of the internet really is what you have to be uh, taking care of now as you move forward into some of these campaigns. And Gert, how about you? And I should uh, have introduced Gert by saying that he, in fact, defended to the, defected rather to the dark side, having worked for <coughs> PayPal and Microsoft uh, prior to the agency world. So has a very unique um, view, particularly on, on channels um, from the technology industry's perspective. Mm. Well, I think if you, if you look at, at the media side, for instance, mm. music, television, newspapers, I think everybody's trying and everybody's trying their own. Technology, technology is, is not uh, a hurdle anymore. It's easy to adapt and to put your content everywhere. So that, that's, not, not, that's not the issue. Mm. I think the big well, opportunity on the one hand side is um, how to fix a broken business model. How, how come that New York Times had to lay off so many people? Um, on the other hand side, you've got startups like Glam Media in the States and in, in, in France, for instance, who changed that model, started from digital, and have a media empire that, that is really working. Um, but it's completely changing the media industry. Look at what happened to the music industry. Look at how Spotify is, has changed the way we listen to music, buy music. We don't buy music. We just have a subscription and we have all the music every time. Are we going to have the same in terms of news? All the news is free. If I look on Twitter, I've got all the news, but I don't have everything. So I think there are the, the, the real changes going to be. It's not on a technological level. With cloud computing, with open, open uh, platforms, it's very easy to go from one platform to the other. But how to, to really make it into a sustainable business in the long run, I think for a lot of things, it's, it's not set yet. Yeah, that's very interesting. If I can just add to that, I mean, <clears throat> those are very valid points. Um, and it's going to sound like a broken record again, looking at from a consumer perspective. But you know, all of us in this room are consumers. Not all of us consume either uh, you know, normal content, digital content, however you want to do. Uh, but understanding where you as a company go is understanding what adds value to the consumer and how he engages. So it's no use in us, uh, you know, for instance, engaging on whatever campaign we want to engage on Twitter if 90% of our base does it's never even heard of it or never uses it or has gone on to something else that's you know, more glam and more, more in. Um, and it's, at the end of the day, where does the consumer find value when they're interacting digitally? Uh, and if you understand that, then you can keep real time, um, understanding the feedback, the trends, all that kind of stuff. You can understand uh, you know, what is free, what's not free, how to get it. One of the biggest problems I see from businesses in a lot of our markets is that they try and centralize. Um, the music industry did this. The more they centralized, the more you had people going around decentralizing the model. Um, and a lot of media companies that have gone through terrible transitions, could still continue to go some through, through some terrible transitions, continue to say, well, we have to control, we have to centralize, we have to keep everything in this little basket. And the more they do that, the more people go to other little baskets outside of their, their sort of kingdom. Um, and if we don't understand the consumer perspective on where they actually get their value adds, whether they get it from a Spotify, or whether they get it from an iTunes, or um, any of those relations, the less we'll understand where to actually market to them, talk to them, engage with them. To add to that, I think one of the biggest problems you'll find is not channels. It's understanding your presence in front of these new consumers as well, because it's not just the people who you're going to target. It's a whole raft of other people as well are going to come and see you and see what you're like. So your digital brand, your digital presence, your identity, need, you need to understand that before you go and take different channels as well. You can't just randomly go out there because your brand will either grow or shrink. And you need to make sure you're controlling some of that and positioning yourself correctly in front of, quite frankly, a whole raft of new consumers that you don't know how to control. And the internet is not about control, it's about letting go. But you have to drive your own identity as a unique company. You can't just say channel one or channel two. 
Interesting. Are there any uh, questions from the floor in connection with that? <coughs> Thank you. Boyana Bellamy from Accenture. Hi. So my question relates to um, the way you see social media and this new digitalization um, affecting business to business world. Because it is, to me, very clear how we are absolutely going to be determine the way we behave, we as, we as companies, based on what consumers think. But what about companies that, that are in business to business space? Where is that digitalization, social media, and online world? I don't know how to call it otherwise, right? How is that going to play for those of us who are in B2B? I mean, I mean I'll, I'll start, because I actually, I'm in a B2B company. You won't find an arm inside logo anywhere. We sell B2B. And we took a radical shift of stopping all print media and everything else. And then we sat down and said, how do we get the internet going? What we really wanted to do was touch as many of our customers as possible in the way that they wanted we to be touched, in a social media way. So we set up blog sites, and we set up Twitters, and we enabled Facebook sites. And we went around and said, how do you want to communicate with us? And before we knew it, we had tens of thousands of people following us on Twitter, so we don't put out PR releases. And the press people like that, and our customers like that. We have LinkedIn pages, we have private websites for people. We enabled the customers who we value to go and touch us in the ways that they felt comfortable with. And occasionally some of them said, yes, we'd like PowerPoint slides. So we'd come along and show PowerPoint slides. But most of them now, are comfortable with this and it's gone three or four years of learning and adapting to the culture of the companies that you're dealing with and so the privacy and security becomes important the data that they want and access to the data that they want is important and your brand where you touch everybody else becomes important so we've enabled multiple channels and we go and check each of those channels every day which one's best which one's which one do customers really want? And what we're finding is customers in new emerging markets much prefer to deal with it in a social media world. They'll post on our blog sites. More than half of our blog site hits come from China. For us, that's all about new media. And we enable some of that. And you just have to go check things. And you make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I think what might be interesting to consider is how, <coughs> how social media and, and new channels are actually changing business models too. Um, and that's particularly interesting in the B2B world uh, because as uh, our question was, was asked of, um, we all certainly understand from a consumer point of view how um, social media is changing the market. But in a B2B world, actual business models can, can be dramatically impacted by it. Uh, in fact, Arm is a good example, in, although Arm, in fact, originally set up <coughs> as an ecosystem model originally 25 years ago. It's very radical. Um, and so, in effect, social media maps better to it. But you've, you've found that there's been um, sort of spin-out effect from the community building, haven't you, with social media channels? I mean, it's, what we've done is not just talk to our customers, but our customers' customers, and our, all the way down the value chain, stopping just before the consumer. And we're now able to go and put messages out that don't just have push to our customers, but our customers' customers have pull coming in place. And that's done from not increasing our sales force and not increasing our marketing effort, but being able to go and touch and find those important markets that we need to go and influence and putting pull in place as well. So we have a 1,000 companies that we work with in our connected community who have special websites that we deal with them and special blog sites. And we enable them to really put pull in the industry and get our brand out there. So we've enabled this ecosystem to build around us um, on the internet in a social media world, which has allowed far greater reach than we've ever thought possible before. Mm. I'd like to add one, one thing. I think in B2B, one of the things that, that work tremendously well using digital and social is, is really working on thought leadership. Um, if you think about, well, people say, well, Facebook is <coughs> the biggest, 800 uh, million people are using it, but if you look at Twitter, okay, it's much smaller, 200 million people, but the people who are using it have um, a very influential uh, role to play. 
Um, all the journalists are there, a lot of politicians, uh, policy makers are in there, and whether you're uh, ARM or another Accenture, for instance, um, if they are talking, they have, in a way, thanks to Twitter or thanks to social media, direct access to those people. If they can provide interesting content that those people are going to retweet or give their comments on, that is going to have much more effect than another print ad, for instance, in, in, uh, in some uh, uh, in-flight magazine. So I think the real value is there. And just to say, DLA, I think you missed an opportunity because you have a lot of influentials here in the room, but you haven't taken uh, the, the, the potential of spreading the thought leadership that is in this room to spread it and use the digital assets outside. And I think that is the real value in terms of, of uh, B2B in connection with digital or social media. I think there's a natural reluctance on the part of the legal world to get too mm. embroiled in uh, social media, would I be right? <laughs> Maybe you need a good social media agency. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, out of That's curiosity, I'm sorry, another question? Uh, it's Richard Given from HSBC again, sorry. Um, can I ask, in the social media world, how do you deal with reputation? Um, you, um, for the, I don't know if anyone's heard of Dave Carroll, um, but he did a beautiful song called United Break Guitars after they broke his guitar and spent six months refusing to pay him compensation and um, as a result had a huge um, PR disaster on their hands. Uh, in our world, our uh, ATM network went down briefly one Friday afternoon and within an hour had over a thousand tweets, including people tweeting to the FSA what's happening to HSBC's uh, cash machines. Um, uh, you can, no longer can you just deal with the 80% of your market and, and, and recognize there's always going to be a few people who are going to be recalcitrant. Uh, those people now have a voice and a, and a medium through social channels to, to broadcast. How do you address that problem? I, I think you already said it. You, you, you don't control it. It's out in the open. The, the channels are used by so many people that you can't stop it. So the only way to react to that is to be as transparent and as fast, because it is real time, as fast as possible. Um, we have worked on that side, for instance, for companies like IKEA or others where sometimes very, very negative, in, they come into the press in a very, very negative way. If we don't react within minutes and have a real engagement of and, and whatever the problem is, then you have a problem. But we can't stop it, we can't embezzle it. It's really using the channels where it breaks, responding, being open, making a, a task force around it, but you have to be very, very uh, transparent and very quick. I think that's a big, big difference. But you can't hide it. I think um, a lot of companies are scared of this negative reaction yeah. and this immediate you know, response that you get from which are your customers. <laughs> so, one, you, you can't be scared. And I would add a couple of other words to that. You've got to be honest and you've got to be <coughs> responsible. And United had a massive opportunity in front of them. And every company needs to understand that every time something negative happens, it gives you an opportunity to engage with your consumer positively. It gives you a, an opportunity to actually turn that negativity into something positive. Now, you could have 100,000 tweets running out within an hour on HSBC um, on your cash machines. But the point is it gives you an opportunity to engage with 100,000 consumers, which might be peeved at you at that point in time, but which you could turn by being honest, we have a problem. This is the problem. This is how we're going to fix it. You know, making sure that the rest of the world knows that you have an issue. There is no perfect company in the world. There is no perfect service in the world. It just doesn't exist. But every time something goes wrong, you have an opportunity to engage with the customer. There is no consumer that comes to you and says, oh, by the way, you're great. Can I engage with you? Can I phone your call center and tell you how great you are? They don't. The only time you ever hear from them is something goes wrong. And the immediate reaction in the old world was, we'll delay it, we'll make it slow, we'll add bureaucracy, we'll cover it. You know, in a year's time, you'll get tired of talking to us, and it's over. And it was the old adage of one bad cust you know, one disappointed customer gives you 10 disappointed customers. That's changed. One disappointed customer gives you a million disappointed mm -hmm. customers today. 
So you can't be scared, but you have to be honest, you have to be responsible, and see every negative response that might come out as an opportunity to create advocates. And if you actually approach it from that way, and you practically implement it that way, it changes your entire way in which you engage with social media. Instead of running scared, you're actually running ahead of the trend all the time. I'd be interested to know if the panel, and maybe we should ask the uh, floor as well, if you think there are any particularly good examples of organisations, both on the consumer side, which is the obvious place in terms of uh, reputation protection, but, but perhaps also on the B2B side, who've, um, who've visibly implemented great um, digital channels and social media to serve their customer base. I think there's a, there's a very, um, well, in the advertising world, there's a famous example of KLM, <coughs> the airline company. Yes, yeah. They have a whole, they have integrated the call center to use all of the channels that are around. And they've completely integrated all social media channels as well. So whenever you complain and you just tweet, within 30 seconds, somebody is going to answer you saying, can we, can we take this offline so that they, they start using the same channel, but then not that everybody sees it, and they answer them. And they use that channel specifically for that group. And now they are really um, making that a central part of their organization. Because those guys have to be able to react quickly. So they need to be able to make decisions. Like the example of HSBC, um, if you need to make a big statement and you leave it up to the social media guy, if he has a very junior role, that's going to be a difficult mm. one. So that has an implication on how you structure your organization that's as true. well. Uh, but KLM does a fantastic job. Give it a try, stand in line, say you, I'm on flight XYZ, you will see within 30 seconds somebody is going to help you mm. much faster than if you would call and keep waiting. In that's the quite funny I was going to mention KLM because I'm, I'm a very loyal customer of KLM, but I'm also the one who hates their planes the most. <laughs> <laughs> they're crap. Uh, their seats are crap. Their business class is crap. Their food is crap. <laughs> But I continue to fly them. And it is one of these reasons, because the ease of use is just, it's immense. Right. Um, the ease of their miles, the ease of, of everything around it, and the fact that you can get taken care of very, very quickly. I don't have to wait with some of the other airlines for you know, 30 days to get a response that comes through snail mail, and hopefully I'll just disappear. Um, that is a, that's a very good example. Yeah, very good. Ian, well, good? I, I like Dell. And I like Dell in the new world where Michael Dell goes, I'm thinking about launching these sorts of products, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And gets real-time feedback from real-time customers in public and then goes, you know what, I'll do this or I'll do that. I like the way that some of this new technology is used, not just in the bad side of answering queries or we've missed a flight or your ATMs don't work, but designing and developing new, new products. Dell started that, and they're very, very good at understanding their customer base and defining new products and asking questions of their customer base using some of this. I think it's a great example of how the internet can be used in, in dynamic ways to affect a B2B business. Thanks very much. Any other questions on, on that subject? No? So we're rounding up ahead of time, I think. That, I'm sorry, did somebody? Yep. Hello, my name is Anna from Firefly, and I was just wondering, because I get this question asked a lot, and that is, how have you begun to measure your own influence in the social media sphere, whether that's your companies or on your own merits as spokespeople, assuming that you are spokespeople, and what metrics do you use, and do you know your own cloud scores? I do. <laughs> but I, I don't think it has a, a, um, a big value, <coughs> especially cloud, or everybody is, is working around with it. I think the only metric at the moment, especially if you look at communication and marketing, that I give a certain value to would be the net promoter score, which is something that has been used for, I don't remember uh, NPS net promoter score, 10, 15 years, even when we were not talking about social media and others. The fact is just that you measure how many people would recommend your brand, your product, or your service, whether it's B2B or B2C, and then you look at what is the difference and if, is, is it going up or down, and then you take the, the, the top level. 
they are trying now, for instance, Net Promoter Score with Nielsen is trying now to integrate the influential scores and so on into the Net Promoter Scores. It's not come out yet, but I think that is an evolution that is going to be, to be helpful. Of course, just seeing how influential somebody is by how many followers he has, I don't think there's much value in that. It depends who those followers are, what they have to say, and so on and so on. But it's an, it's an interesting um, area mm. where there's still a lot of um, a growth and a lot of companies, startup companies, and there has a, the, it has an interesting value, but I don't think a lot of them are there yet. Yeah, I mean, we, we're a, MH is a holding company. <clears throat> so most people in this room wouldn't even know who the hell we are, which is great. It's the way we want it. <laughs> um, you know, we have specific consumer brands in each of the markets, and each of them um, have their own you know, uh, social media club. Net Promote is a, is a very good one, specifically if you're in an e-commerce business. Um, so it varies from business to business. As an, as an individual, you know, the less people know about you, sometimes the better. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on how you want to approach it. It depends on what you're doing. If, you're a, if your job is networking, then a cloud score would be extremely important to you. If, in fact, you don't want people bothering you, then the last thing you want is a cloud score. So it depends on your usage. It depends on what you want to do. Dan, have you got a view? Oh, and as the largest British technology company that spends zero dollars on advertising anywhere, um, the biggest measure I get is when I turn up at meetings and execs go, ah, oh, Arm, I know about you. And you dig into where they found out and it was somebody's recommended or somebody's tweeted or they've gone through some sort of social media. <coughs> and probably over the last five years we've gone from Arm, who are you, half an hour of conversation to explain who we do, to Arm, um, I know about you, let's have a conversation. So. The real B2B world that we live in, we've got our brand out there and people kind of know about us and once you get a momentum, that's really good. I think the other side of this is how you maintain a brand um, reputation on the web as well. And I don't think we have a great metrics for reputation. Um, we, get, we always have liked and disliked and number of scores and number of stars and all the rest of it. I don't think there's a reputational way of looking on the web in a way that we can uh, metricize it yet. And so what we do is we go and have a look at where we're mentioned, where we're not mentioned, who's coming onto our site, etc. And then we go, is the arrow going in the right direction or not? And if it's not, we'll sit down. If it is, we'll go figure out what we did wrong. Thank you. At least the advantage of digital is that everything is measurable. Yes, Correct. That's true. Yeah, the disadvantage is everything is measurable. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and more tools to do so uh, every day seem to be <coughs> launched. Um, our final area really is on the issue. I'm sorry, there is one question there at the back. Um, my name is Frazy. I'm from DK Software. Um, it's a bit of a macro subject here, but uh, what do you think the implications of social media are for commerce in the future, basically? And the reason I'm asking is um, I read about this app from Amazon, where basically you can go in store and you can scan a barcode and you can see how much the item is there. So basically, prices become more transparent. Um, another reason I'm asking is uh, when I did my master's a year, a years ago, uh, it was on uncertainty and um, that included volatility and diversity. Uh, my research basically showed that 20 years ago, diversity was a major problem. Today, it's not, probably because of the internet. But uh, what implications do you think it has for the future? Mobile apps and, and social media, basically. I think um, on the commerce side, which is, which is really the subject I love, um, th there is a lot of talk going on about S-commerce and. You know, who's going to be the leader in S-commerce and all of that. Uh, at the end of the day, S-commerce becomes a marketing channel to a real company that still has logistics, still has a supply chain, still has suppliers, still has delivery, still has to get a physical product in some form of way to where you are, where you've defined it wants to be. 
So the real point of S-commerce is, is that it, it, it becomes an extremely important channel for e-commerce um, as a whole. In terms of the, the uh, digital world and applications from an, uh, an e-commerce perspective, um, it's becoming a hell of a lot more innovative than it was. Mm. And what Amazon has done, you'll be surprised to know, but a lot of Eastern European com uh, companies and countries already do, which is price comparison on your mobile phone, walking into a store, either scanning a barcode or doing a picture recognition. You can today literally take a picture of a chair and send it up to a platform, and the platform will come back with an answer and say, well, these are the offers I have for you. And that's not fantasy. That's been in practice for at least two years in, in so-called emerging Europe. People don't know about it, but it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there is a lot of that. We talk about mobile payments, for instance. Mm. You know, NFC, I'm going to take my iPhone and touch. That's just a small thing. There is no such thing as mobile payments anymore because all I have to do is click yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one-click payments. It's all done. So, <coughs> as people are living more online, you get so much more that you can do, specifically across the European Union where, you know, there's price arbitrage that comes into play, there's parallel trade, all those kind of things, which makes life wonderful as a consumer. It only benefits the consumer, which is great. It's tough for retail, and if anyone's read the latest Economist, um, there's a very beautiful article in terms of the growth of e-commerce across Europe, specifically what's going to happen to retail, all the wonderful things around that. And it's just happening more and more. You have more people engaging online, more people rather trusting the brand online, still going to look in store, but still buying online because it's more convenient, it's more price efficient. Um, one of the protections that are around that are very well established. Uh, in a lot of emerging Europe, you find the retail density is not as great as in Western Europe. So it's so much more convenient to buy online when it's minus 17 outside. Yes. <laughs> um, and that's just the way the world is going. And if you're not, if you don't understand that as a retailer, you're in trouble. And if you try and replicate your retail basis online, like you have it offline, I'm sorry to say, but you're in trouble. That's not how people engage from an e-commerce perspective. I don't wait for you to go pick it up in a store somewhere 40 miles away and then bring it to me and then you don't have it and you give me a substitute. And that's not e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So e-commerce is, is, is the future growth. It's where the real money lies in terms of real growth coming out, where consumers will be the winners because they will be the ones that benefit from price comparison across markets, uh, from being able to have a diverse selection of any supply chain they could think of. So S-commerce, in my mind, will be a channel to that, but they're not the delivery vehicle. E-commerce is the delivery vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like to add to that. I also think, I, I absolutely agree, but I also think it's a huge potential for growth, especially if you look at emerging markets, for instance. When I worked at PayPal, I was working on, in Southeast Asia, and every time we had, thanks to lawyers, we had agreement to, to really develop the, 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 the payment possibilities of PayPal in a, in a new country, then it was immediately a lot of little e-commerce shops that went open. One guy, mom and pop shops, little SME businesses, but really thriving. They immediately had a huge market. They had a global market, and if they were good enough, but just little shops, it was a real driver for a local community. And that's, that's why I see a, a, a huge potential. And it, goes, yeah. it can go very, very, very fast. I want to add one, sorry, I just want to add one thing to that. And that is that a lot of people see e-commerce as the scary thing that's going to kill retail and the high street and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to give you a real world example, which um, you know, is, is not hidden <coughs> data and stats. It's actually facts that we presented to the EU uh, recently. Um, and that is that in Poland, we have a, we have a platform called Allegro, which is a, a very big commerce platform, um, which facilitates small businesses coming online, selling, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that that platform itself has a direct correlation to a million jobs. Mm. It's a direct correlation to a million jobs. 
the commerce industry in Poland itself, which is a so-called emerging Europe, okay, now contributes more to the GDP than the mining industry. These are real, real growth sectors that will change the fabric of growth in Europe if we do it properly. If we make it benefit the consumers and if we make it competitively efficient for all the people to, to operate in these markets. I, mean, I, I agree with you. I spend a lot of time in China. And the growth of e-commerce, S-commerce, whatever you like to call it, payments on phones in China is huge. The business models they put around that um, will blow, blow away anything that's going on in Europe and the US at the moment. And what worries me is when we talk about regulation over here, we're going to slow that business down and will affect what goes on in London and the financial institutions because we want to go and make sure that they're totally protected while the rest of the emerging market, which uses phones, will be enabling commerce across the world. And I think we have to be very careful about uh, stopping some of the regulation, uh, putting in place regulation and stopping some of the initiatives that will affect financial institutions around the world. People like Alipay, PayPal, Google Wallet will become very important and how they're mo monitored and measured. We need to make sure that we don't go into an old world of this is how we've always done it, therefore we'll always do it this way. It's linked into couponing and advertising. It's linked into buy now. It's linked into how money is transferred. And we'll find that as we move into the next three or four years, the younger generation will see e-commerce in the same way as we see credit cards now. And we want to be in Europe ahead of that game, not behind it. But I think the generations that we're starting to see coming out from China, coming out from India, coming out from Africa, are really leading that charge. And we should make sure that we are keeping up with them, if not ahead and providing the right services. And that's what worries me about some of this stuff, is we talk about e-commerce is coming. It's already here. It's already here around the world. We need to be leading it, not following it. And uh, I think in the interest of time there, thank you, uh, Ian, for that uh, segue. We, we're going to close on, on that whole discussion about the perhaps implications of the proposals to amend the EU privacy directive that were announced last week, um, which have some fairly significant um, uh, potential impact, certainly on our industry. I think a couple of the things that caught my eye were the um, elements around data disclosure and the imperative <coughs> of companies to disclose any breach that happens at any time um, in the public domain and also the uh, enforcement whereby we're looking at um, very significant fines, uh, much more significant than we've seen in the past up to, I think they were saying, 0.5% um, of an organisation's global turnover um, and serious breaches it, it, you know, beyond that. It would be interesting to maybe ask one of our legal eagles here to, uh, to talk to us a little bit about, um, about the scope of that and then maybe we could have a discussion around uh, the implications for business. Patrick, would you be able to talk a little bit to the elements of it? Okay. Sir. Um, well, of course, from a, from a legal perspective, a lot is happening, and, and uh, we will be elaborating on that a little bit further in, uh, this afternoon at the last session. Um, but it is very clear, and, and Mrs. Cruz also this morning already announced uh, some of these initiatives that uh, as part of the digital agenda, that uh, in Brussels, um, a few legal initiatives are being undertaken, uh, undertaken towards social media. And actually, my question to, towards the panel would be, um, don't you think there is a risk of over-regulating uh, this kind of, of, of new media? Because I think we're just at the beginning, and it's, we are probably still in the hype uh, um, atmosphere. Maybe you're already a bit further or, or much further into that area, but for many of us, especially law firms or more traditional uh, companies, we are just starting to explore these kind of, of new initiatives and making use of social media. By the way, I can confirm officially 50 minutes ago, we tweeted the first <laughs> DLA Piper uh, uh, online uh, on, on the summit. Um, but, but actually, do you think there is a risk that uh, policymakers would be too eager 
to regulate this new area and actually that they would inhibit uh, the, the, this new kind of, of initiatives being taken by, by the industry. If I may, I think everything has to be in balance. <clears throat> yes, the one side is we are all worried that it's going to be too overregulated, and therefore we keep lobbyists employed and well fed and all that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> if I may ask the audience one question, who has a LinkedIn profile? Who knows that LinkedIn changed their privacy two weeks ago? Who went into your account settings and changed that uh, they can't advertise? Only a couple. Okay. That is an example to me of doing it the wrong way. Okay. No one knows the fact that LinkedIn can use your profile to advertise with your name, your reputation. And unless you go in and opt out of that, they will do that. So anyone who has a LinkedIn profile who hasn't do done that, go and do that. That's the wrong side of regulation. That's the wrong side of privacy and, and, and protection of my profile, my data. And no matter who anyone says, that has to be regulated. But those are immediate impacts that will come out of this act. How do you regulate suddenly that kind of, you know, you have to go and do a negative opt-out kind of thing. And it's going to hit people like Facebook as well across the EU because these things just happen and then if you don't like it, you go and opt out afterwards. Yeah. So there are going to be a lot of impacts with that. But then if the balance is done correctly, for instance, in this instance, I would never agree with LinkedIn to use my reputation to go in and advertise against. Um, it should all wash out properly. As long as we do it in a balanced way and as long as we don't use it to such an extent where we over-regulate the environment that then stifles innovation. In Europe, we have no entrepreneurial internet company. Can anyone name me one? Okay, they're all clones from somewhere else. And the reason is, is we have stifled innovation quite a lot in Europe and we now have an opportunity to actually go further and promote innovation by putting balanced regulation in place that one protects you but also promotes innovation and really getting into models moving forward. I know I'll add to that. How, the cloud computing, we talked several times about that. How do you regulate my bank account being in Switzerland, my gambling being in the Caymans, my download of content being in Ghana, and my music sitting in China? All from one account, all from one company. Well, okay, maybe I could regulate bits of it. And the company's based in Ireland. How do you regulate all of this? Well, you can try and you can put some frameworks in place, but what we need to do is not just act in Europe, but try and act globally as well. Influence the rest of the world to go and do this because cloud computing <coughs> doesn't stop at the borders of Europe, doesn't start again in America. It is worldwide and if we really want to make use of all of this, we should be driving our standards not in Europe, but worldwide and enabling this World Wide Web to really take uh, the regulations that make sense, not just Europe stifling its industries and everybody else being free reign. Mm. I.e. don't implement SOPA. <laughs> yes, <laughs> quite. <laughs> I think maybe that if, if you look at where it started in email marketing, for instance, where everybody now adopted an opt-in uh, <coughs> rule, I think if, if the example from LinkedIn is a good one, which is actually an, an opt-out one, mm. which doesn't, a lot of pe people don't feel comfortable about that, if they know about it. If they know about it. So I think that is a, a, a sane and balanced way of, of, of doing it. But I think that the opt-in element should be across all channels and all of those things. Because Facebook, LinkedIn, they change their policies and you have to dig deep before you know what they are mm. going to do. Mm. Um, and bring that on a global level, I think that is, I don't think that will uh, have an impact on, on growth or potential, but it will at least give enough uh, privacy for consumers and uh, a feeling that nobody is going to use your data for one way or another. Uh, I, might, I might have had a different perspective about a month ago. But a month ago, um, my son had a, a very bad accident with a car and it was in all the newspapers in Belgium, and it was one newspaper, and they 
of course, since I work in digital, there's a lot of stuff about me on the internet. One newspaper found a lot of pictures from me from holidays, from a blog with me and my son, and they published all of those pictures without asking my permission. And that for me was <coughs> the first time on a personal level that I had a feeling this is going too far. If you would have something in terms of an opt-in where you say you can use, like LinkedIn for instance, or you can't, and at least you have a simple and balanced principle that every consumer out there can, can understand. And I think with email marketing, it's starting to, to really be something that everybody understands and which doesn't demand a lot of investments. Because if I look at the elements that we wrote about um, resolutions, there are a lot of uh, lawyers and IT companies going to make a lot of money of implementing those rules for those companies, which is great. But is that really driving value for a local economy or regional economy? I don't think so. so. Any questions before we break for lunch? I see ending on a legal note has kept everybody quiet. That or your uh, grumbling tummies. Well, thank you very much to our panel and thank you very much for listening. Thank you.